name's Bond. James Bond. Occasionally, a game will be released that turns the industry on its head. New technologies and engines can push the limitations of graphics and visuals. New business models can set an industry standard for new business practices. New mechanics can redefine the direction of an entire genre. And niche customers can be pleased with a wacky and creative new direction. A GoldenEye 007 is certainly one of those games. Among early console shooters, it is widely considered to be the very best, and it remains to this day one of the finest examples of excellence in gaming on the Nintendo 64. My question is, why? Why is it a video game based on a film did so unquestionably well while most others are essentially trash? Keep in mind that we're talking about the third best-selling game on the system. It even beat Ocarina of Time. The question of GoldenEye 007's success has three separate answers. The first is, frankly, it was a good game. This seems like it should be pretty obvious and something you've probably all heard before, but it bears repeating. When you play something like King Kong or the Transformers games, it's a pretty bleak reminder that most movie games are cheaply made cash tie-ins, made by a bunch of suits looking for a quick buck. Developers are pushed hard to crank out any old tripe on strict deadlines. Conditions like this are more often than not a vacuum for creativity. I mean, if you don't give your artists room to be creative, then you're just going to get games like, well, King Kong and the Transformers games. But GoldenEye wasn't a cheap movie tie-in. GoldenEye the movie came out in November 1995, but the game produced by Rare didn't hit shelves until August of 97. This additional time and care created a product that in many ways still holds up. Sure, the first-person shooter genre has come a long way, but for the most part, gunfights are still as wacky and exhilarating as they were years ago. The controls are good, the action is great, and the levels and objectives are interesting. Slap on a fast-paced multiplayer and you have yourself a mechanical classic. That said, GoldenEye's success as a game isn't due to it merely being a well-put-together game. A lot of mechanically tight games come out, like all the time actually, but they aren't instant everyone must play classics. The fact of the matter is, first person shooters didn't really exist on consoles back then. Nothing like GoldenEye had ever really come out for the home entertainment systems, so when it did, it was an entirely new experience for gamers of all ages. For many, including myself, it was their first foray into first person shooters. But it's important to recognize that these mechanics didn't just do well because of their novelty. This is where the second arena comes in, and things start to get a little trickier. The second victory won by GoldenEye was that it was a culturally resonant artifact. There's a common adage that goes, half of the world's population has seen a James Bond film. It's so common, in fact, that Sir Roger Moore cites it in his book Bond on Bond. Now, the validity of this claim is questionable at best, but the extent of the public's familiarity with the franchise as a whole is difficult to understate. Go ahead, ask anyone on the street about James Bond, and you'll likely get a shaken not stirred, or a Bond James Bond, or at the very least, you'll get his profession. Much like Star Wars or Indiana Jones, the Bond series is something that is burned into our collective unconscious. Exciting adventures, exotic locations, and all the coolest gadgets around are closely tied to this figure of pop culture, even to the most out of touch. All three of these things are present in GoldenEye 007 for the 64. The great gameplay I mentioned earlier also fulfilled what was previously vicarious entertainment, and there's a great power in that. But it goes even further than that, culturally speaking. By the end of the 1980s, the James Bond franchise was pretty much done. The films and the characters had largely been the same as they had been for the last 27 years, at least in the eyes of the public. And despite attempts to alter this... Then you have my resignation, sir. We're not a country club, 007. Fewer and fewer people were going to see these movies, culminating with License to Kill, the lowest box office return in the franchise's history. The sleek and suave James Bond had grown stale for the vast majority of the film-going population. People were more interested in macho dudes with giant guns in the 80s. Think about flicks like Commando and Die Hard, they were all the rage. All this, coupled with a nasty little copyright dispute regarding ownership to Bond, led to a six-year gap between License to Kill and GoldenEye. 
the longest drought in the history of the series. The world had changed considerably during the production of Goldeneye, and critics were concerned Bond had no place in the modern world. This is a Bond for the 90s. Bond. James Bond. The new James Bond. It's not so much sex appeal as box office appeal. Whether the new Bond movie called The Golden Eye will be a golden egg. Whether this James Bond, like his legendary martini, will shake or merely stir things up. Then, kabooms! Golden Eye dropped and it was a colossal success. James Bond had caught his fourth or fifth wind and recaptured the imagination of the world. Kids who grew up never seeing a James Bond film in theaters finally got to see a damn good one on the big screen. And older folks familiar with the franchise got to relive the magic all over again. Even if you hadn't seen it in theaters, the media was ablaze with James Bond this and James Bond that. It even spawned a new wave of knockoffs. Oh, hell, let's just do what we always do, hijack some nuclear weapons and hold the world hostage. This Bond bubble, created by the six years between License to Kill and Goldeneye, created a perfect storm of public readiness for the return of Bond. And the film's quality ensured subsequent related media like, say, a video game, would be a welcome inclusion. But why did the world accept him once he returned? Sure, Goldeneye was a kick-ass movie, but is there anything potentially artistic going on there that translated into the game? Well, the answer is, yeah. Yep, believe it or not, GoldenEye 007 does something interesting and artistic. But to understand what's artistic about the game, you need to understand what's artistic about the film. You remember the journalist's concerns about Bond not being relevant in the 90s? Well, frankly, they had a good point. The Bond of the 60s and 70s simply wouldn't fly in that day and age. Wacky villains had been parodied to death, computers were now seen less as wonderful visions of the future but more as a commonplace object, and gender relations had come a long, long way. Just do as I say, William. Yes, James. Most importantly, perhaps, Goldeneye was the first James Bond film to be released after the fall of the Soviet Union. The weapons of mass destruction that made the Soviet Union so damn scary were now in the hands of volatile states most people were completely unfamiliar with. There is another satellite. Another Goldeneye. What I'm saying is James Bond was entering a drastically different social and political landscape. The world had an entirely new collection of anxieties and fears that the old Bond tropes were ill-equipped to address. The teaser for GoldenEye seemed to be aware of this, but the finished product is, in my opinion, one of the finest examples of artistic nuance in the entire series. Bond himself remained largely the same, but the world around him had changed. Women were no longer putting up with his overtly sexist nature. As far as I can remember, James, you've never had me. You like boys with toys. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. One villain, Zenya Onatop, Onatop? Onatop. Used her sexuality as a weapon, turning one of Bond's greatest strengths against him. Another villain, Boris, was the embodiment of the new cyber threats posed in this new world and addressed an entirely new demographic. I am invincible! Millennials. It's also the first Bond film to prominently focus on the power of the internet and in political and criminal power struggles. And finally, the primary antagonists, Alec Trevelyan, and Russian allies Valentin and Mishkin highlight the fact that friends could become enemies and enemies friends, as shifts in power and national allegiances change throughout history. Everything you risk your life and limb for has changed. All of these facets culminate in the alias chosen by Trevelyan, Giannis. The two-faced god, of course, parallels Alec's two-faced nature, but something else as well. In Roman mythology, Giannis was often associated with change and transitions within a cycle, and this perfectly mirrors Bond himself. No matter how the world may twist and change, Bond always seems to find a way to stay fresh and relevant. Which brings me, uh, finally, to the artistic qualities of the game. The game addresses many of the anxieties in the film, but translates some, quite well, into gameplay. First. The ambiguous nature of direction, friend, and foe in this post-Cold War world is brilliantly captured in a number of ways. 
The meandering, non-linear level design and limited draw distance gives the player the sensation of being in a dark, labyrinthian world. Even when outdoors, the environment is oppressive and provides very little explicit direction. The character models follow suit. Muddy character textures insinuate a lack of clear insight into motivations, intentions, and loyalties. Even the multiplayer has some of this going on. The ridiculous number of characters to choose from illustrate that even established relationships, like Bond and Natalia for example, can be twisted into competition by external pressures influencing them, in this case, the players themselves. Second, this game addresses something interesting that all James Bond films deal with to one extent or another, humanity's relationship with rapidly progressing technology. There isn't a lot of academic work out there regarding James Bond, but a popular topic among what does exist is how technology in the film series is a source of power and anxiety. Countless films in the series have something to do with some super neat gun, or like a doomsday device of some kind, and it's up to James Bond's mastery of technology to come out on top. This is forced on the player in many of the objectives for missions on higher difficulties. There are several examples of this, but one that comes to mind is the communications dish in the mission's Surface 1 and 2. On the first mission, you simply run up to the control panel, press the B button, and power it down. But when you return later on in the game, the player is expected to destroy the panels entirely. If you were a dumb kid like me playing Surface 2 for the first time, you just ran up to the panels and pressed B again, triggering a trap. I know it's like a minor example, but it is in there. Acknowledgement of the frustrations of accelerated technological advancement. Jesus, that was a mouthful. It's also utilized in other missions as well. Sometimes you gotta hit B, sometimes you gotta hit Z, uh, sometimes you just gotta blow stuff up. That second point builds nicely into my last, but it differs in a very important capacity. It leaves the realm of gameplay and examines the physical act of playing video games themselves. In Goldeneye, the game and the movie, Trevelyan ultimately wants to do a bad thing using technology and James Bond wants to stop him using technology. This is of course mirrored by the very act of playing video games. Some random developer out there makes a piece of technology that poses some kind of challenge, i.e. a cartridge, or a disc, or what have you, and a player is charged with surmounting that challenge by interfacing with technology, i.e. a mouse and keyboard, or controller, or whatever. It's kind of ironic that a power fantasy and a stereotypical nerd activity has so much in common, don't you think? So, to recap, GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64 succeeded as a video game, as an artifact of cultural resonance, and, in my opinion, as a work of art. Considering the perfect storm of conditions, I'm not positive there will ever be a finer video game based on a movie, at least not in my lifetime. Eh, well, who knows. With Oculus Rift coming out and the film industry's obsession with remakes and reboots, it might happen soon, I suppose. But until a movie game can be released that does these things better than Goldeneye did, 